Shalom. I'd like to speak to you about the subject of when people act badly. I make no claims of being smarter than the average bear in matters of finance. The focus of my learning has been elsewhere, but I am confident of what I have learned from recognized experts. One of these experts was a very fine financial counselor, a leader of our congregation, Temple Israel of Norfolk, from the previous generation. He told me that when investing, it is important to have at least part of one's portfolio structured, as he called it, quote, to protect the downside. What he meant is that there are inevitably times when things get worse economically. Part of one's investment should be in kinds of assets that keep their values when times are tough. Those assets may not rise as high as others when times are good, but they will be a life raft in adversity. That perspective, gleaned from the domain of financial planning, can help us understand an important lesson of the Bible. Here's the lesson. The legislation of the Torah raises up our level of ethics in two ways. At the high end, it challenges us to be better still, to turn our spontaneous but fragile kindness into lifelong habit. But what it does at the bottom end is also critical. The Torah takes aim at precisely those situations where people are likely to act badly and it establishes an ethical floor. There's a Jewish way of describing this. Our tradition says that people are a compound of two contradictory impulses. We call these the Yetzer Hatov and the Yetzer Hara, the good inclination and the evil inclination. Some laws are there to strengthen your Yetzer Hatov, your good inclination. And some laws are there to weaken your Yetzer Hara. We need them both. Let's think about the way in which the evil inclination, the Yetzer Hara, expresses itself. There are red hot manifestations of Yetzer Hara, such as lust or hatred or desire for vengeance or greed. And then there are room temperature manifestations of the evil inclination. High handedness, hard heartedness, carelessness about the needs of others, apathy rather than empathy, the casual exploitation of one's superior position when a relationship is with someone weaker. A large fraction of the laws of this week's section of the book of Deuteronomy, the weekly portion known as Ki Tetze, many of the laws speak to those negative situations. I will walk you through a few of the laws, not all of them, but enough to illustrate the point. I don't intend to analyze any one of those laws in great depth, but rather to build up a composite picture to show you that the Torah is reaching down to the level of people's propensity to act badly. And the Torah is creating an ethical guardrail. You may not be a saint if you keep these laws, but you will be a better person by far than one who is not thus restrained. So let's have a look through the laws of this section. The section begins in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21. And the first paragraph deals with lust. 
It's addressed to the soldier in battle. When you take the field against your enemies and you take some captives and you see among the captives a beautiful woman. Now, sad to say, armies throughout time have practiced the horrendous crime of rape upon the captive women during wartime situations. The Torah is the first record in human history of the prohibition against a soldier raping a captive. So that's hardly the height of ethics because in the Torah's understanding, the man may nonetheless marry a woman and we don't like it because she doesn't have a full consent to say no. Remember, this is 2,500 years old. This is not establishing the ceiling of behavior. It's establishing the floor. Don't fall beneath that floor. Sad to say, armies to this very day have failed to reach even that. Hatred. The very next paragraph in the Torah talks about a man who has a wife whom he's no longer in love with. And they have a son together. That son is their firstborn. The man subsequently married again, has a wife with whom he is in love. But the Torah has an inheritance pattern where the firstborn gets an extra portion. So the Torah says, don't take it out on the firstborn son that you're no longer in love with his mother. Don't let hatred produce that kind of collateral damage. Again, that's the floor. It's not the ceiling, but we could do well to learn by it. How about vengeance? The next chapter of the Torah talks about executed criminals. They had capital punishment in the days of the Bible, but it says, don't dishonor the corpse of the executed criminal. Bury the corpse speedily. It was common practice throughout many, many centuries to dishonor the dead bodies of enemies because of a desire for vengeance. The Torah wants to curb that desire for vengeance. What about the common, all too common negative emotion of greed? In the next chapter, the Torah speaks about restoring lost property. Chapter 22, verse two. If you see your fellow's ox or sheep gone astray, do not ignore it, you must take it back. When I was in grade school, we had a statement in the playground. Finders keepers, losers weepers. I don't know if that's uh, done on playgrounds all around the country. I grew up in New Jersey. That's what we said in those playgrounds. The Torah doesn't agree, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. When you find an object, there's an ethical demand for you to counteract your greed and to strive to return it. What about apathy to another person's suffering? There's a law in the Torah which had it been followed in America might well have led to a course of action that obviated the need for the civil war. The Torah says that you shall not return a fugitive slave to his owner. Think about the turmoil in America in the 1850s when fugitive slave return laws were being passed and it led to such sectional tension. Other examples where the Torah wants to counteract the lack of compassion that a person might have if he's in a stronger position. What if someone comes to you for a charity loan? The Torah says, if you give him a loan, you may not charge interest because 
He's coming to you because he's in distress. Moreover, what if someone offers you some collateral? You may not go into his house without his permission to take the collateral. Let him bring it out to you. In other words, a person who is economically one down from you, economically in an inferior position, shouldn't lose his human dignity. It's all too easy for someone who is, after all, the source of help for someone poor to begin to get a sense of superiority. The Torah here legislates against that. Don't feel superior because you have more in your wallet. This is just a short summary of a much larger set of laws. These ethical floor setting laws, some of which I've just reviewed, and there are others aplenty, are sometimes omitted from Bible abridgments and anthologies because they sound less inspiring than the commandments to love the Lord and to love our fellow human. But in the messy reality of real life, these floor setting laws are just as important in the ethical advancement of humanity, which after all is God's main project as described by the Bible. God takes the incredible gamble of creating humans with free will. We're free to be as good as God wants us to be or as bad as our worst impulses may dictate. God will not turn us into ethical robots. God will plead, cajole, inspire. That is the task of the rules of life as given in the Bible. God wants us to be the noble creatures we could be. We have to do our part, not only when the moral skies are clear, but also when the storm clouds and crosswinds of lust, greed, and hatred block the sun. Especially in those stormy times, we have the opportunity to live up to God's faith in us. We live in times that bring out the fear, the greed, and the hatred in a person's soul. Any cursory glance at the news of the day reconfirms that. Precisely now, let us bring to light the image of God that makes each of us precious, each of us human. Amen. <laughs>